Welcome back to Light the Fuse, your Mission Impossible hub. This is where you go, Charles, when you want Mission Impossible stuff. This is your hub. This is the hub. Yeah, the hub. Definitely the hub. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, how you doing, Charles? What are you What are you doing? You feeling good? Yeah, I'm feeling good. How about you? Yeah, you know it's you know it's the middle of a Monday, so that's not you know energy level isn't super high, but you know I'm rallying for this. I gotta I gotta bring that energy and that intensity to the to the show and to my fans. You know what I mean? I'm feeling it. I know yeah. you got a lot of fans out there who are real excited to hear your voice and 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 count me as one of them. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Well, what are you? What are we doing today, Charles? You want to tell people what we're uh, what we're up to? Well, we are revisiting another cinematographer interview that we did, a great one with Dan Mindel. I, I, I think it's pronounced Mindel. I've said I know we've both said Mindel before, but I've heard people say Mindel, and I think that's how you pronounce it. Either way, if it's Dan Mindel or Dan Mindel, he is an incredible cinematographer, and we love his work. And it was such a great time talking with him and interviewing him. This is from. 2020. So this was, uh, you know, a couple years ago. And uh, we just thought maybe it's a little, a little cinematographer theming here. And we, re- we revisited Robert Ellswit last week. This week we're revis- revisiting Dan Mendel. And uh, obviously we're still seeking out some of the other cinematographers in the series. Uh, but uh, we wanted to, yeah, check this out. I thought this is a, you know, we talked we talked about Shanghai Noon with it, which is, you know, I always love talking about Jackie Chan stuff. Of course, I should say, if you didn't know, I'm sure you saw it in the title of the episode. He was the cinematographer of Mission Impossible Three. If you did listen to this a couple years ago, I think it's worth listening to again. And uh, if you haven't listened to it, then enjoy because it is a great chat. Did you have anything you wanted to say? Well, I just wanted to say, if you want even more from him, that maybe we can put it in the show notes, Charles, but I did a exhaustive history of John Carter, and Dan really helped me out on that one. That's right. That was a great article, too. Yeah, that was from earlier this year. So I reconnected with him, and we chatted about uh, John Carter, and he was very helpful. He was really, really, really great. And so... Yes. Yeah. We will put that in the show notes. Definitely check that out. That is a fascinating read. As a, that whole movie, that whole production is a fascinating. It is. He actually, we talk about a little bit about it in this interview as well. That's right. I think that's how I knew I could. I could. You could count broach him. the topic. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I wouldn't. He wasn't going to hold back. He gave you the truth. Yeah. I mean, almost everybody talked to me except Taylor Kitsch, which I completely understand. I get it. Yes. Um, but yeah, it was. It's, it's a lot of people were really. It was great how how forward everybody was about it. I mean, Andrew Stanton talks on the record oh, yeah. about it. I mean, it's it's great. Yeah. So we'll we'll put that in the show notes, but he he's great. He did great work on that movie and he he really helped me out on that. So I just wanted to give him a shout out. And you know what? Speaking of shout outs, Charles, it's my Ooh. favorite part of the show right yeah, now. We seamless do... transition. I love yeah. this. Okay, yeah, give us the shout outs. So um we are are sponsored by Jeremy Dillon and he wanted me to let everybody know that Imogen Clark, who is an artist that he works with, has a new single called Compensating. And it's available wherever you stream or download music. So please check out that single. I also want to tell everybody uh, that John B., Elvis Ripley, and Suchet made this episode possible. So without them, we literally could not make the show, right? Yeah, John B. uh, actually reached out to us recently because, uh, you know, as you said, this episode is brought to you by John B. We always, you know, he's been doing that for a long time for us. We're so grateful. But he he reached out. I think I told you about this, right? He said he ran into uh, Joe Kaczynski and Claudio Miranda at the airport. Uh, And he ended up having a little chat with them and he got their autographs. I thought that was so cool. That's really cool. It's also appropriate that he did it at an airport. (laughs) <laughs> because very true i didn't even think of that yeah, yeah. yeah he uh he he yeah he said that they were really nice and he talked to them and he mentioned light the fuse to them and he said thank you to to uh joe for coming on the show and we've got to get claudio miranda speaking of cinematographers we need to get claudio miranda who shot top gun maverick on this show and we are working on it we're trying but uh you know you'll you'll know as soon as it happens as soon as it happens <laughs> he'll be on the show you yes. know we'll, we'll have him but um all right, well, Charles, let's get into this revisiting episode. We'll be back about halfway through for some more words, and uh, we'll be back at the end as well. Today we are joined by Dan Mandel, the amazing... Cinematographer, I hope you're okay with this kind of praise, Dan, first of all, because we're going to be just ladling it on the whole time. 
I'll, I'll give you an hour to stop it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, Dan Mandel is, uh, is one of the most uh, incredible cinematographers working today, but we are talking to him today primarily about his work on Mission Impossible 3. We always like to ask people, like, did you watch the old show uh, as a kid or anything? Or what was your relationship with Mission Impossible before you signed on to the movie? Um, it was really one of my favorite TV shows as a kid, yes. I used to watch it religiously. Really? Do you have, yeah. any, do you have any favorite episodes? No, uh, you know, I'm I'm probably older than you, and that makes it uh, really impossible to recall. Uh, you know, it's just it, it's just the um, the title sequence is something that uh, you know always stayed. But once we once we uh, we realized, or once I realized, I was going to make it. Um, it it it, uh, it was a life changing. Thing for me, really. Really? How, how so? Well, I met JJ. Right. Uh, and um, he's probably one of the most intelligent people I've ever meet, met. Um, he's, he's insanely smart. We would love to meet him and have him on the show at one day. We, we have emailed him, but he, he has not emailed us back. Maybe by the time this comes out, he will have emailed us and said... I can't wait to be on your show. I heard so many great things from Dan Mandel, but we we're not there yet. Um, well, he's 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 very generous with his time. I don't see why he would not do it for you. How did you guys come come upon the look of the movie? Because it it really does look very different from any of the movies that came before it and any of the ones that came after it. So, how did you guys kind of settle on that specific look for the third movie? Um, when I met him, he told me, uh, I was working with Tony Scott and, um, we were doing, I think we had just finished Revenge, or, uh, not Revenge, sorry, uh, Domino. And, um, JJ said to me that, uh, he really loved the way that Enemy of the State looked and wanted to have that sort of feel for Mission Impossible. And, um... I said to him, well, you know, half of the, the, the look comes from the anamorphic format that we shot it in, and the rest was decided in the, the art department and uh, in Tony's very specific process of working. And so JJ was immediately sort of all ears and made it his business to understand the look and the feel that anamorphics brought to storytelling because coming from TV, not many people used that format at the time. And so basically we had a, a crash course in that technology and uh, we decided that that was, you know, how it was going to, how it was going to go. And, um, that's how it ended up, basically. How did you guys decide on the, the close-ups and the number of close-ups and the frequency with which you would sort of try that stuff out? Because that's sort of like the defining look of that movie for a lot of people is just how many close-ups there are uh, and how, how much of Tom Cruise's face you really get to see. <laughs> um, well, it's what happens or it's what used to happen when episodic directors moved into movie making the 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 need for close-ups for a tv show is a, a different sort of specific to to what happens in cinema and um because obviously the tv's smaller it sits in the corner or used to be and people would watch from you know the sofa and so the need for a close close-up was more uh, intense than for cinema where obviously you've got a huge screen and you don't want to be too close to somebody because it becomes scary uh, for the audience to get a massive close-up of somebody uh, in in your face. So uh, it was sort of a symbiotic or, a, or, or it happened by osmosis. Uh, JJ always wanted to go closer and 
that's what we did. Um, I don't think it really hurt us at all. I don't think it's a bad thing. It, it's a it's a great punctuation, and and it's sort of become one of JJ's looks is that just when you think you're you're as close as you're going to get, the camera moves in another few inches, and you go, <laughs> oh yeah, that that now we're there. Right. Um, <laughs> Uh, Charles, do you want to ask about some of the set pieces? Well, I also want. Well, before that, I also wanted to ask about just the the, col- the use of color. The colors are so gorgeous in this movie, uh, and there were different colors for different parts of the. For like in Shanghai, it seems like there's a diff- slightly different color palette. Like, was it? Can you talk about the use of color yeah. in the movie? Yeah, I mean, I do love using color, and um, coming from the Tony Scott school of of filmmaking, we used to mess around with color an awful lot in the photographic process and the the lighting style and all sorts of things. And to me, the texturization of a film has a lot to do with color. Um, and the mood that you can set with it is, uh, for me, very, very important. And so we, we took a conscious decision to give the different parts of the movie a different look and feel. And um, uh, to me, the fact that you're asking the question means that it, 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 it works. That yeah. sort of thing does work. And, and um, part of the, the rationale is also to, when you cut, cutting back between studio and location and sort of built and not built sets. Um, for me, uh, it's a, I, I hate to be bumped when I'm watching it myself in the cinema. And part of the way I try to alleviate that for people watching the movies that I make is to try and make the texture and the, the, the lighting as real and as sort of um, atmospheric as possible. I think you can feel that. I mean, there's a real texture to everything in this movie. That's just amazing. Yeah, definitely. It's an important part of the process for me is that uh, the movie, when you go to a movie, it's n- you're not watching a National Geographic documentary. You're watching a story. And you want the story to be as enveloping, if that is a word, as possible. You, you want to sit there and just be and inhale everything. And to me, color is part of that. Amazing. What is the process with JJ for you? I mean, you've done a lot of movies with him up until even just now, the latest Rise of Skywalker. Do you shot list with him? Do you do like storyboards, or is it storyboards for some sequences, shot lists for other? I mean, what is that kind of? Um, how do you come up with your plan with JJ for how to shoot each scene? We don't really have a set plan uh, of how these things work, but what happens is early on in the movie we interact with the art department as we go through the sets and the locations. And that gives us a huge amount of information or gives me a huge amount of information about what he's thinking in terms of mood and in, um, you know, what is, what is involved in shooting those particular se- scenes and sequences. And we go from there to the built sets and the sort of manifestations uh, off paper and into the real world. And during that process, what I like to do is um, shoot copious amounts of tests on the sets and uh, on a, uh, uh, we'll set up a special stage to shoot tests on where we look at textures and colors and wardrobe and props and paints and everything so that we really have a, a, a great idea of how things are going to look when we shoot them. But when it comes to the actual day of shooting, unless it's a really major stunt sequence or something that involves a really technical amount, you know, amount of technical equipment, we will basically arrive on set and he will map it out on the spot. 
and we, we will literally uh, seat of the pants style, go through it, rehearse, block it, light it, shoot it. He he likes he likes to be very spontaneous about it. That's it. That's that's very surprising. Isn't that surprising to you, Charles? Because because yes. uh, Marianne and Mary Jo talk to us about this kind of like multiple shot thing that JJ does a lot, and he he does it a lot. It's some in Mission Impossible Three, a lot in Star Trek and and the Star Wars, where you know it'll be a long shot that kind of does several different things, sort of in the way that Spielberg does it. So even shots like that that have these different components are just sort of improvised essentially yeah i mean i i would be um i would be reticent to use improvised okay because what happens is what happens is that we will rehearse with the actors on the set and we will all watch what's going on and one of the real benefits of working with a director that's also a writer is that he's listening to the words as well as working out the geography. So often the script will change when he hears the words acted out for him on the set. He'll go, oh, no, I don't like that. Or can, can we do it like this or something like that? So it's a multi-leveled sort of approach where it's not just us dialing in the camera move and the lighting. Uh, it's also the words and that will guide him and us uh, in how we're going to cover the scene. And so, as you said, he will, with myself and the camera operators, start to choreograph a master shot that covers all the details by moving the camera from place to place around the set, following the actors, going from a wide master into a, a close-up. And often that'll be it. That'll be the coverage. Mm. And it takes a very brave man to do that um, because obviously when you get to cutting, you don't have much coverage up your sleeve. So if you screw it up, you've got what you've got. And so we're quite fastidious about it. And... Um, so basically, Marianne and, uh, and the editors are right. He does do that. Uh, but um, we've sort of, in, in the last couple of movies, in the, the last two Star Wars, we got a bit more precise about it because he often decided that it would be better to shoot it with one camera uh, and not try to accomplish too much with two cameras or more uh, in terms of telling the story. And so, um, you know, it's something that has fermented and grown over the last decade or so. Um, but I, I do think that he is still one of the most, well, he is one of the most engaging filmmakers out there for the viewer, even if you don't realise it. That's yeah, as a as a viewer. So so are you you're mainly shooting with one camera nowadays with him because that's pretty different. Tony Scott would shoot with multiple cameras, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, he's he's more uh, judicious with uh, how we how we go about it because he wants the photography and the close ups and the sort of establishes to have a bit more uh, quality to them. And the way you do that is by shooting with one camera. Right, yeah. That's not to say we didn't use many cameras. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's my favorite kind of filmmaking. We, yeah, like, we always talk about John McTiernan on the show. He's one of my favorite directors uh, who did uh, Die Hard. And, yeah. and you know, he always talks about that, that, you know, yeah, yeah. shooting with one camera is, that's the, you know, it's always, it's always in, the work that I've done to the DPs I always work with, they always want to do, you don't want to cross shoot with cameras because then you're, you're sacrificing lighting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Drew, did you want to ask about set pieces? Yeah. Well, I mean, what, what was your sort of approach to these set pieces? Cause each one looks different. Like obviously the Berlin sequence looks so different from the Vatican looks so different from the, from the bridge. Did you have kind of a, an overarching idea about how you were going to tackle these or, or what were, what was JJ's sort of, design of these these uh, set pieces and, and how did you kind of accomplish them? 
I think that the thing that dictates most everything is whether there are visual effects or not involved in in the sequence. And um, I think that the the bridge sequence and the helicopter sequence where um, they're flying through the windmills uh, and what's going on in um, Shanghai, they all had a massive amount of visual effects involved mm. in them. And when, when that happens, that really does take away from the ability to use spontaneous photography because everything's measured out and everything's pre-calculated. So um, what we tried to do was not let the visual effects dictate how the sequence were going to, were going to be made in the sense that there's a level of clunkiness that arrives when you do that. And McTiernan and those guys back in the day, everything was in camera. Mm -hmm. And that's why we love that so much. It just, just looks and feels the way it is. So, the bridge, for example, was a, we built that in a field in Calabasas. And it was, I, I was really skeptical about that. But at some point or another, as a cinematographer, you've got to really trust the visual effects guys around you when you're doing stuff like that. And I learned a massive life lesson on that movie working with Roger. Yeah. And, um, it, that's what started my relationship with with him, and with his help, we were able to make those sequences work. They were very precisely pre-vised. They were very precisely mapped out and built, and they were very precisely shot. Well, we we're always fascinated with like what is your relationship with Roger? I mean, you've done so many movies with him, or or somebody from ILM, you know, the last few movies, and. You know, I, I just watched the Skywalker documentary. I don't think Charles has watched it yet. But, I mean, you guys are back-to-back -back in Jordan on all these crazy, you know, locations and sets. And so, like, what is that relationship like? Well, it's one of the most exciting parts of my job is working with visual effects, not only from a technocratic point of view, but also from the aesthetic point of view. And Roger like a lot of his colleagues and people in his part of the industry, is not only a technocrat, but he's an artist. And he has a massive appreciation for the art of cinema. And the art of cinema, as far as I'm concerned, has enveloped CG effects. And they've got better and better and better over the last decade and a half, say. And one of the reasons why it's got better is because of people like Roger, uh, who has um, an aesthetic that allows guys like me to bring our ideas and, and foibles into their arena, account for them, and make us look like geniuses. <laughs> uh, and how can you not love that? Yeah. So you're, are, do you like pass off information to them? Like, this is the light streak that we got from inside the Enterprise that you can do outside of it. Or I mean, like, are you kind of like, are you guys trading information like that all the time? Yeah. Okay. I mean, basically, the, the, they have left us in the dust. Uh, <laughs> in, the in the beginning, they took a lot of information from us. They were interested in what we were doing and how we were doing it, but they've actually banked all that. They've got it in the databases and they don't actually need us anymore. They could do it all by themselves if they wanted to. <laughs> um, but on a daily basis, if I'm shooting those kind of things and those guys are with me, I listen to every single word they say because... I try to give them the tools that they need to make me look good. And if that means sharing information, I share absolutely everything that I have. Wow. Uh, well, it, it, we're, making, we're making the movie, you know? It's yeah. for everybody. It's not, it's, there's no I in team. Right. 
Are there uh, are there cinematographers that you admired when you started in this? I mean, obviously you were. Did you start as a first uh, as a first AC, like a camera assistant for uh, for Tony Scott's movies? Uh, I started making the tea in a studio when I was a kid. And, wow. Uh, I the first real cinematographer I was introduced to was a guy called Michael Saracen, and Michael had shot just so many movies that uh, I went back and looked at and I got to work with guys like Peter Bijou and then I started working as a a, a camera assistant, uh, a loader, and worked on uh, a Tony Scott movie as a trainee loader and from that moment, Tony t- sort of took a liking to me and basically set my career on its on its way. He gave me everything that I have and taught me everything that I know uh, or knew up to a point. And um, uh, it was just one of those priceless things that happens to people in their lives. Wow. He's, he, he was one of our favorites. I mean, still is one of our favorites and, yeah, it kills I mean, me that we we don't have more. We don't have you know new Tony Scott movies coming out. It's just yeah. devastating. It is. I I mean you know as a uh, a youngster I grew up watching Nixon and um, all Bob's films. I love him. I think he's he's one of the greatest cinematographers ever. I think he's probably more responsible for the look and feel of modern filmmaking than people realize that so many people emulate his style. I think that um, I have more heroes than not in in the cinematographic world. And um, it, it, it's, a, it's an ever changing art form, which uh, is what makes it so exciting for me, I think. Yeah. Do you have any uh, specific Tony Scott stories from um, Enemy of the State or or Spy Game or, or Domino or, or other ones that you worked on or, as well? Or, or Crimson Tide or, yeah. Um, uh, there are so many stories. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that um, what he sort of encapsulated uh, as an action film director was the, well, there are two things. One, he, as a, um, an immigrant in America, uh, his view of Americana was so sort of stylized that he, uh, as well as his brother and other commercial makers at the time, reshaped the way that uh, perhaps America was viewed overseas. And so in movies like Top Gun and um, what was that uh, indie movie, the, the, the race car movie? Um, Days of Thunder? Yeah. Days of Thun- Thunder. He kind of brought an Americana view of America back to life again. And, and Michael Bay sort of picked it up from... Tony and ran with it and for me working uh, with Tony at that time exposed me to the idea that um, storytelling the glossiness that he brought to it uh, was something that was missing to that point and the, the, the idea that the sort of front cover of Vogue could be put into uh, aesthetically could be put into movies and people would just love it and and that's what he did and that's what Bob did too this kind of stylized hyper real look that uh, people still emulate today um, for me is something that uh, I took away from Tony uh, but he as a as a, a director had the 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 ability to confuse guys like me and technicians on the on the set in order to buy himself time <laughs> and while 
while he was confusing us and we would be running around thinking, oh my God, oh my God, he would be sitting rereading the script or the sequence and trying to figure his way out of a, perhaps a dead end that he had got himself into <laughs> without letting any, anybody realise what was going on. And uh, that was a very, very useful tool that I picked up from him. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I think it was on Spy Game, we, we had a massive night exterior uh, in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and so Tony was in his trailer. It was late afternoon and we were turning all the lights on, getting ready for the exterior. And um, he, he sent for me to come to his trailer. I went in this trailer and he said, uh, let's, let's walk the, the set. So we, we went out and he walked out the door of the trailer and he said... Um, why the lights facing that direction? We're shooting in the other direction. And I said, no, we're not. We talked about shooting this way. And he said, no, 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 that, that's not true. You've made a mistake. And I, I thought, oh, Jesus, how, how did I make that mistake? And he said, call me when you're ready. <laughs> and he went back in the trailer. In the trailer. Basically, he, he framed me. <laughs> and um, I took it as that I had made the mistake. I, cu I couldn't believe that, a, that, that he was actually just trying to buy himself time. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's something that uh, I became very acutely aware of uh, working with him after that, that he was really great at doing that kind of thing just fooling people into thinking that they had sort of heard him incorrectly or whatever. And he'd go, okay, just call me when you're ready. <laughs> wow, it's a great problem-solving device. <laughs> um, I've got to well, ask Well, yeah, you. I mean, I learned... I was going to say I learned from that that when you're on set and there's huge things going on and, and the director says, wants to change his mind or wants to do something that you didn't discuss or anything like that, that it's our job to say, yeah, no problem. Uh, just give me half an hour and I'll fix it. I'll get it, you know, I'll do whatever I can. It's not to get upset and pissy and stamp your foot and go, no, no, that's not what we discussed. Uh, we've got to do it like this. And I think that that's the one of the biggest takeaways I took away from working with Tony over the years was the idea that you should be able to adjust and, and do it gracefully without, um, you know, getting pissy about anything. Right. Charles, this is, we're in a weird place. We're in the middle of the episode. In the middle of the interview. Yeah, that isn't, we're not usually here. No, but, uh, feels weird. But, but today we are, and, and it's important. Uh, th the reason we're here is important. We're here to tell you to please sign up for our Patreon, patreon.com slash light the fuse. If you visit that web address, you will find out all about it. We've got different tiers you can sign up for. And it really, it's, it's what makes the show possible. It really supports the show. You know, we're not uh, we're not doing this for the money. I'll say that <laughs> we do this show for the passion of it, and we need your help to make it possible. Yes. Uh, so please, please support the show. If you listen every week, you're a fan of the show. Please sign up for our Patreon at Patreon.com/LightTheFuse. You get weekly bonus content, which we we call Light the Fuse Plus. It's our other podcast. It's another podcast entirely. You get every week new episodes where we talk about everything from. You know, recently we did uh, all the best Halloween movies uh, that you could watch. We did recommendations for, for movies to watch at Halloween. And um, we did a whole episode about the Predator franchise. We did an episode about our favorite TV shows of all time. So please sign up. 
Uh, it really would mean a lot to us. And uh, anything else, Drew? No, I think it's a great idea that people sign up for the Patreon. I think that those episodes are a lot of fun. And if you enjoy this show, you will really get a kick out of those extra episodes, as well as bonus perks like our weekly Zoom chat and uh, other things like that. So, um, yeah, sign up, won't you? Yes, please, please do. And uh, and now we'll return you back to the second half of the uh, interview with Dan Mindel. to ask about uh one of my favorite movies that you did uh is a gorgeous also anamorphic uh is shanghai noon and jackie oh, chan boy, here we go. Uh-huh. jackie chan's one of my heroes <laughs> I, I bring him up on the show all the time because there are parallels with tom cruise <laughs> doing all his own stunts these days uh with jackie chan jackie chan i think it's just amazing i gotta ask how you know what was it like working with jackie on shanghai noon shanghai noon started off as nothing it was just a. Uh like a, an afterthought that, um, what was the name of the company that made that movie? Uh, it was Disney, I think, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, Disney took it over, but it, it started uh, as um, Roger Birnbaum. Oh, yes. Anyway. Roger Birnbaum, yeah. Spyglass. The director, Tom, Spyglass. Spyglass, right, yeah. exactly. It was a small Spyglass movie, and Tom Day was a commercial director at RSA, at Tony Scott's company. And I had worked for ages with RSA, with all the directors, and I think I worked with Tom as a commercial cameraman, I think. I can't remember. Uh, And they asked me to do Shanghai Noon. And over the years I had worked with Tony, we had done many, many, many Marlboro commercials, which were mini movies out in the desert where we would shoot guys riding horses and lassoing and doing all that kind of stuff. And the budgets on those commercials were massive. And what Tony and I used to do was try stuff out. We'd go out on these commercials and we'd try stuff out for the next movie. And that was Tony's thing. He used commercials to teach himself what he wanted to do in his next movie look-wise and all that kind of stuff. So the jump from the the Marlboro commercial to a Western was not a big deal. It was, it seemed natural, but a comedy was something that, um, seeing I'm not a particularly funny person, I didn't actually understand what I was doing in in a comedy. So I went up to Canada and met with Jackie Chan, and I have to tell you, he changed my life for sure. Really? One of the greatest people I've ever met, yeah. At at so many levels, really, at so many levels. uh, I'm sure you've heard it all before, and it's all true. Everything you've heard about him is true. He is one of the most brilliant filmmakers out there. He's one of the most brilliant philanthropists out there. And he is, while it's impossible not to have an ego in this industry, uh, he's one of the only um, actors, directors that I've ever met that I've seen do other jobs on the set apart from his own. And I've seen him pick up horse shit and I've seen him (laughs) uh, help the, the ADs and... Whatever. So I, I, there's nothing, I can't say enough about him, uh, how great he is. Wow. So uh, we set off to make this movie and I said to them, look, I want to shoot anamorphic. That's what I do. Uh, that's all I want to do. And they went, yeah, all right, fine. How do you, how'd you shoot a comedy with anamorphics? Because in a lot of people's minds, comedies are wide angle spherical lenses that you put in people's faces. And that's funny, that's comedy. But to me, Western and anamorphic can be, they go in the same sentence. I mean, you just look at all those movies shot out. Yeah, well, Blazing, in, Blazing Saddles is anamorphic too. 
Yeah, yeah. And so is, uh, what's that Jack Lemmon movie? Uh, is it The Apartment? Yeah, The Apartment. Uh, yeah. I, th- I think that's 240. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so uh, we set out to make this movie and it is, to me, it's luscious in its saturation and its color. Um, and it's um, funny because of the comedy. It, it works. And um, it has integrity. Uh, it's not just... It, it, it ended up with integrity, not just a sort of middle-of-the-road comedy movie. And that's because Jackie, as a film director himself and as a stuntman himself, brought so much to it. Uh, he he taught us how to shoot that kind of action. And we ended up, we were in Calgary in, in Canada with a lot of Jackie's entourage not being able to speak English at the time. Jackie's English was a bit iffy as well. And we all became really great friends. And on the weekends would go out and we would take them to the local restaurants and teach them about uh, European and American wines and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of the Chinese actors and stuntmen that came with us told us that when we went to China to shoot, that they would look after us and reciprocate. And that's what they did. When we went to, sh- to uh, Beijing, they, they really took care of us. And uh, at the time, China wasn't really making many movies or Western movies. And we got to see a snapshot of China at the time, which we would never have got to be able to have seen had we not been with these people, let let alone the unofficial king of China, uh, Jackie. And when we wrapped in Beijing, he, Jackie Chan flew me, the focus puller, the camera operator, and one of the producers down to Hong Kong to give us a personal tour of his favorite restaurants and places in Hong Kong on his dime. Wow. And that was (laughs) one of the most fantastic sort of moments in my filmmaking career was to get a a, a personal guided tour by Jackie Chan. Wow. I think Um, that's Charles's dream uh, in life. (laughs) (laughs) I've, I've, we've heard before that there were members of Jackie Chan's stunt team that were in MI3 in the Shanghai sequence. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, there were. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. I, I think that they, uh, at the time, they were really the only sort of global stunt team out there. I mean, there were American stunt teams, but n- they hadn't sort of gone global at that point the way that that the Chinese or the Hong Kong school had. Uh, I think they taught us everything. After um, Crouching Tiger, uh, all the wire work on that movie put them on the global stage as the wire masters. Right. And Jackie is so specific about how to shoot and edit action uh, and like for clarity yeah. and, and fights, was there anything yeah. from that that you learned and, and like applied to MI3 or, or anything going forward in your career? Oh yeah, oh absolutely. He he, coming from the Tony Scott school, I wanted to go tight all the time. I wanted I wanted to shoot long lenses and go tight. And Jackie was saying, no, 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 you can't shoot this way. You have to shoot wide. The problem with American coverage of kung fu or karate or martial arts fights is they're all too tight and you can't see what's going on i want to see what's going on and so that meant coming back and being on a on a a wide enough lens so that you could see all the choreography of the the fights because for them it it's a ballet it's not just smashing someone's head in and so, yes, I learned about that choreography. And also we would shoot um, 22 frames per second uh, for when Jackie was fighting to speed up his action a bit and all sorts of things. 
I remember we had a wide angle lens on the ground and uh, a stunt man was going to fall into the camera, you know, into the foreground. And he wanted a mat on the ground in front of the camera. And so we put the mat there and the, the visual effects guys were saying, yeah, yeah, we'll paint it out and everything like that. And Jackie comes along and takes the mat away and says, what are you doing? Just fall on the concrete. <laughs> and he said, look, I, I spent 20 years falling on the concrete. You're young, you can do it, do it. And he, that's what we did. And he was uh, a hard taskmaster, but uh, totally, as far as I'm concerned, rational. Amazing. Well, I think you're the only person we've talked to that's worked with Jackie Chan and Tom Cruise. And Tom Cruise is often, you know, like Charles said, compared to Jackie Chan, not not only with the stunt, the level of stunt work that he does, but this kind of like commitment to the craft. And, you know, yeah. uh, what was what was your experience with with Tom Cruise and maybe, you know, um, compare him to your experience with Jackie Chan? Well, there's there's two things. The first thing is one. When you have your leading man do his own stunts, you can put the camera in his face and there's no cheating. That's the guy doing the stunt. That's, that's a very big um, part of the asset of doing that. Someone like Tom doing a, a major stunt in, right in front of camera. The second thing is that because it's them doing the stunt, the level of fastidiousness that's involved, whether it's the guys doing the choreography or it's the photography, you basically have one chance to get this, the leading actor doing this stunt and therefore there's no margin of error. The photography has to be good and everything else. So that makes everybody elevate their game. The second thing is that because these guys do their own stunts and have done it multiple times on multiple movies for multiple years, they have studied the craft beyond, you know, most reasonable people in the industry. So if you can have a conversation with Jackie Chan about movies or stunts or editing or anything, you better have done your homework. And the same thing goes for Tom Cruise. And I love that. I think it's just absolutely genius when you have people that can tell you who edited Battleship Potemkin on the set and you're making movies with these people. That's what, that's what it is for me. It's just fantastic. I love that shit. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so cool. Uh, Drew, do you want to ask about John Carter? Yes, I do, Charles. Thank you for teeing that up for me. <laughs> Gotta say, um, Dan, big John Carter fan. Really love that that movie and was wondering what that process was like for you working with a guy that came from animation. I mean, we've obviously covered the the Brad Bird Ghost Protocol so in-depth on our, our, our podcast, but I, I would love to hear what it was like working with Andrew Stanton and Michael Chabon and all these crazy creatives on, on a movie that had probably just as much animation as a Pixar movie, but also you're shooting all this live action stuff. You know, if this was for your eyes only, <laughs> it might be. It's been long enough. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> it would be one story. Okay. Um, because it's not for your eyes only, it's another story. I was really excited to work with Andrew. At the time, Wally had just come out. And I think that's one of the greatest movies ever made. And I think that Pixar to that point had not put a foot wrong. And it seemed like a logical step for them. But I just think that, that the, creative support that he needed to get from animation to live screen was bigger than they gave him. Okay. Because the, you know, you, you, you can emulate a Sam Peckinpah movie and go out and shoot it not knowing much, but you can't really tell 
somebody how to make a movie, a Sam Peckinpah movie, if they have never made a movie before in terms of what the logistics and just the nuts and bolts of it are. Right. And that, that to me, is where the sort of the physical production line lies. It lies between the studio supporting the director and the infrastructure of the movie uh, and the actual day-to-day -day process of making the movie. And so when I first met Andrew and the whole team at Disney, I said to them that I was really interested in making this movie because at that point, I decided to make visual effects my my business, having just done three visual effects movies with JJ, I wanted to learn more. And it seemed to me the logical step was to go and do this movie with Pixar uh, that was so effects heavy and take what I'd learned from the movies I'd made with JJ and ILM and use it for John Carter. And so when I met these guys, I said, the first thing we should do is we should shoot this movie outside in the Four Corners, somewhere in Arizona, Nevada, Utah, somewhere. And they all went, yeah, yeah, that's great. And cut to England in the middle of winter. <laughs> and that's where they wanted to make this movie on stage in England. Right. <laughs> which was their first mistake. And the second thing that happened was that coming from animation, the, the idea that you could pre a movie from start to finish and shoot the pre and come away with the movie was not really that smart. Right. And we tried to um, bring in the other cameras. We tried to bring in the idea that improvisation happens uh, in front of the cameras on set and that you should embrace that and use it in the edit and all that kind of stuff, not just what has been pre vised which ended up really what was happening. And the, the other thing that happened was they, as in anim many animation movies, when you finish the movie, it's not a big deal to go back and reshoot because it's animated. And that's what they wanted to do. They, they had months of reshoots after the movie was wrapped in LA, having shot it in London and in the Southwest. We went back to Disney and shot more. And basically, I think that in the end, the movie was sort of collapsed before it started, which mm. is such a pity because it was a great story, still is a great story, and it had, I, I think, amazing potential. Was it, a, was it a Pixar movie when you signed on to it? Because I remember at, at one point it kind of went from Pixar to Disney, but sort of began... Was it a Pixar movie when you first got on it? I think that they had transitioned to Disney. Okay. Uh, but uh, when I first started talking to them, I don't think that that physical step had been made yet. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating movie. It is. It is. Yeah. We got to talk about the look of Star Trek might be the most sort of iconic thing you've done in terms of people ripping it off and riffing on it and, you know, making YouTube videos about it and stuff like that. Um, uh -huh. where did the, where did those lens flares come from? And uh, JJ loves them obviously, but the way that you use them was very unique. And, and again, incorporating them into the ILM stuff was, was really unique. Where did that come from? I think we went mad for a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, if you look through Mission Impossible, you'll see some lens flares. Mm-hmm. And we took note of those. And if you look through Ridley Scott's Alien, you'll remember when the astronauts walk out on the planet, they're carrying flashlights. 
And those flashlights have fascinated me since then. And we used those for our flares on Star Trek. The exact same flashlights. Wow. Oh, really? That's amazing. And they are the only tool out there that does what we wanted it to do. And so JJ saw the artifacts of the flares on Mission Impossible and loved them and wanted to incorporate that kind of thing into Star Trek. And so... Uh, as a, as a, a young person, when I was watching uh, Lost in Space and Star Trek and all those space things, and uh, what was that submarine thing? Uh, 20,000 Leagues? No, nah, there was a sort of a later one that was a bit more sci-fi. Anyway, the, all those shows I used to watch as a kid... The thing I, that I hated the most was when they bumped me onto the set visually and I'd go, oh, that's the set. And it's, it used to really annoy the shit out of me that you could tell the difference. <laughs> and so I said to JJ um, in the beginning, so much of this movie or all of this movie is all sets, it's all space. Uh, how do you make it look and feel? like it's real. And the solution was to antagonize the lens with light and make it flare and do stuff that happens when you're outside shooting naturally. And so we went down this road and the idea that we built all the lights into the sets that were going to annoy the lenses. And we brought the flashlights so that we could sort of add to that by hand, at taste, whenever we wanted, uh, was the next thing. And we that's how, how we did it. Basically, the bridge of the Enterprise, the first time you saw it, uh, we wanted it to just blow everyone away. When the, when the door opens and you look in and you go, wow, look at that. And we kind of took the then contemporary Apple Store look and made the Enterprise look and feel that way. Just beautiful light and nice flares and all that kind of stuff. And it, I think it worked. I think it really did work. And uh, that's been my thing all along, is not to be so protective of the lens that you don't get these artifacts happening. And uh, I still think that now. Is the, is the whole ethos of bringing reality to it, is that where that shot of Spock in the elevator came from? Which is, I know, a shot that Charles also is obsessed with, but the shot where he walks, he walks into the elevator, you spin around him and then exit out onto the bridge. Onto the deck, yeah. Yeah, how, yeah. how did that, how did you do that? <laughs> Is there a cut in there, or is is that was that all you? No, it's um, we built an elevator. I, I can't quite remember, <laughs> um, and we we had a, a green screen, mm -hmm. so that when we pan around, you pan off the green screen onto the doors, and the doors open, and you're on the bridge, which was a real set. Okay, so the first location. So, so when he gets on, it's fake and then the when he gets yeah, off it's the bridge yeah he i think we built an elevator okay that went up one one level and so we film him going into the door there's green screen in the background we spin around the the doors open and he walks out and that's jj that that is <laughs> J, jj's sort of mentality is he's think he can visualize that and so therefore he can design the shots because he's basically visualizing what the camera's going to do it's and that is shot. just such a such a great tool to have amazing charles you know that you're obsessed with that shot too right 
Yeah, it's so good. We, we both love that, <laughs> that great... first Star Trek movie is so great. We yeah. love it so much. Oh, it is. It really is. And um, as you say, the the number of people that have sort of run with that look is astounding. Yeah. Was it was it hard that to come back to that world and to go to Star Wars too? I mean, was it hard to to kind of make well, those feel different? It's kind of ended up that I don't do a, a movie unless there's star in the title, and <laughs> that's a bit of a drag. Um, but going to Star Wars was I don't think you get asked to do those things very often in your life to work on an iconoclastic kind of film title that is so resonant in everybody of my age and whatever it's it, it was just nuts and uh so i had no thoughts about it whatsoever about doing it i just wanted to do it but the thing that we inherited unlike a lot of what we had done before was that the look and feel of it was already set. We we weren't going to deviate from that. So the the way that that first Star Wars was shot was basically with total adherence to the rule book that the people before us used. Um, it was it it made it simple in one way, but it really was stifling in another way. Because we we you know there's no flares there's no there's nothing to make any of that work do you know what I mean right it it was we just inherited it and we sort of shaped it more to a contemporary style but uh, in the beginning J J even said to me to see if you can find the lenses that that the mov- first movie was originally shot on whoa that's crazy. So we we looked around and we did tests and all that kind of stuff. But uh, in the end, we built our own lenses because we wanted it to look that way, but we wanted the contemporary contrast and things that come with more modern lenses. And uh, we engineered it uh, from scratch. Wow. That's awesome. I wanted to quickly ask you about uh, the Born Identity because you're credited as an additional yeah. photographer. And I know that the, I've always heard that there were like big reshoots on that movie, and I was just curious. Yeah. So is that what 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 you are uh, what you, what you did on that movie? That's another one of those for your eyes only. Situ- <laughs> situ- I love situations. that movie. I think it's so great. Ah, it's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, long long story, but. Basically, the producers on that movie were completely besides themselves, beside themselves when they saw the director's cut. And Doug Lyman did not have his, how can I put it? He didn't have his film technique down. So uh, the stunt sequences and all the things that were shot by second unit and uh, action directors, the, all that stuff worked, but the the movie itself was di- really sort of disjointed editorially. And so Universal, I think it was Universal, wanted to go back and shoot more uh, so they could get a more coherent cut out of it. And basically they asked me, I got a phone call, do you want to come and do it? And I said, no, I'm not interested in repairing someone else's movie. And um, through massive persuasion from Frank Marshall, who offered great restaurants in Paris and that kind of thing, (laughs) um, I jumped on the plane and went to Paris to to work on that movie. I, I, I can't remember how much time we spent on it, but we shot a big percentage or uh, reshot a big percentage of the movie um, with Doug and Frank and Pat. Was any of it Crowley? The, he always. I've heard that Doug Lyman would shoot stuff without permits, like kind of off the like off the cuff. Was that were, were you doing any of that kind of stuff? 
No, no, no. But I believe that when they were making the movie, they, you know, Doug was hadn't done a massive movie before, so he was still in his old mode of of going out and grabbing shit and whatever. And I think that that that's what got them into trouble. Um, oh, okay. You know, it was such a huge political thing. Um, but the long and short of it is that the movie was brilliant and it reset the action picture genre and that's where Mission Impossible came from, basically. They had to up their game, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everybody did. Bond had to, every, you know. Yeah, ex- exactly. And so the the um, that's all that matters in the end. Yeah. yeah. So were you mainly doing like person to person character stuff more so than action? I honestly can't remember. I think we spent a lot of time with Matt, yeah, doing dialogue and putting in these little pieces that that went into the seventy percent of the movie that that they used, something mm. like that. Don't quote me. <laughs> All right, Charles, is it is it time for our big questions? Um. Yeah, probably. Is there? I mean, there, I could ask you a million questions. Uh, actually, I, quickly, I want to ask you about Ben Stiller because I think Ben Stiller is a, a genius. His, his directing, his, his uh, comedy directing, is amazing. And you shot Zoolander two with him. What was it like working with Stiller? It's one of the hardest jobs I've ever done in my life. Really? Yeah, yeah. He he is a funny, funny man, and but he was so difficult to work with. Um, oh wow! For some re for some reason he was intimidated by me, and I don't I honestly don't know how anyone can be intimidated by me. But uh, anyway, he would only <laughs> speak to to my gaffer and tell him that he wanted more front lighting because uh, uh, the way I was lighting him was not cosmetic enough, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, actor, director. Um, you really have to, you really have to have your shit together, and uh, he's done that many times, and he knows how to do it. And uh, I have a lot of respect for Ben. I loved um, that movie he shot in Iceland, and the movie he shot here in Kauai, um, the war movie, whatever that was called. Oh yeah, Tropic Thunder. Thunder. Um, Tropic Thunder, yes, yeah, so good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we sh- we shot the uh, Zoolander in Rome and um it it just felt like such a stretch. The the script wasn't it didn't really work as far as I'm concerned. Right. Um just so off off kilter that I don't think it ever really resolved as a comedy movie. I I I'm not quite sure. I haven't seen it in years. But uh, it was fun to work at Chinichita and with all the Italians and do a a movie in Rome. It it was great. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, all these moments in time, regardless of how fraught or political or whatever, they are just fabulous moments and uh, should be savoured. And um, I, I savour that time. I see Ben occasionally here in Kauai and we, we have a laugh. I have a lot of respect. It just wasn't the best. Uh, it wasn't the best working relationship then. No, no, and um, you know that's not that, the best movie either. Yeah. No, it kind of it kind of makes me sad because I like to. I have a lot of fun doing what I do, and I really love it, and I love the whole process. So, when there's a when there's a bad moment, it's always a a, a moment of self reflection. What happened and all that kind of stuff, uh, you know. But, uh, again, it's only a movie. It's not uh, the uh, coronavirus. And in the scheme of things, um, you know, who cares? Right. Um, I think I, I have some very dumb questions to ask you that we ask every guest, but I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of reticent to ask you because I feel like it's wasting your time. But we do ask everyone... <laughs> what their favorite uh, Tom Cruise hairstyles are in this series of films. I'm assuming you've seen all the Mission Impossible movies, right? 
Yeah, I'm not that much of a, an aficionado that I would be able to tell you the okay. difference in the hairstyles. All right, that's fair enough. Um, <laughs> I, I, we can skip that one. Perhaps I should I should be able to, but um, I just can't can't uh, give you I can't grab a visual. So um, well, I'm, listen, I'm a, Dan, we got a lot of time on our hands. If you want to go revisit, you know, you can send us an email <laughs> about the hairstyles. Um, okay. Okay. We, okay. <laughs> We also wanted to, you know, like maybe what are your top three Mission Impossible movies in the in the series? What are your favorites? Uh, I thought six was really a good action movie, mm-hmm. although it made no sense. Uh, the <laughs> visuals were fantastic. <laughs> the ex- the exposition was hard to uh, sort of engage in when you're waiting for the next thing to happen. Right. I loved three. I thought that was a good one. And, hmm, two, uh, not, it, it's, uh, I think that the problem with those kind of movies is they date really quickly. Um, right. And, and so the early ones, even three, seem dated. The third, the, my third favorite, I don't know, I can't tell you which one I love, but uh, I, th- I think that the job that they did photographically and stunt-wise on six was phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. It's really unbelievable. Well, Dan, thank you so much for for being on the show. This has meant the world to us. We've been wanting to talk to you since we started the podcast. So this is a huge thrill um, for us. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, too. And um, it's it's great that there are people that are so interested in what we do to want to go and and uncover the dirt and the, (laughs) the, the, the... the other side of it. Um, I'm sad that I can't give you more dirt, but uh, you <laughs> well, we're about to turn the recording off right now, so we'll, you know, you can, yeah, you can un- uncover more dirt while we, when we uh, stop recording. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I really don't trust you. And, um, <laughs> let's build our relationship on that. Okay, let's build it. When, once we're at that level of trust, yes. Uh, Thank you so okay, much. Okay, so listen, listen. Yeah, I'm here, and uh, great to talk to you. And we're back. What a guy. What a guy. Love his energy, love his enthusiasm, love his passion. Man, he just did such amazing work on, on Mission Impossible 3. The, the, the co- as we talked about with him, the colors and everything are just really beautiful. And uh, yeah, the, I love his work on Shanghai Noon as well. He, he does, I mean, he comes from the Tony Scott school. So how can you not love this guy? I mean, he's yeah. shot some Tony Scott movies. I mean, that's just amazing. Um, and he tells great stories about Tony Scott in this interview as well. Uh, so... Yeah, we love him, and uh, we hope you enjoyed, uh, you know, a, a trip down memory lane with with uh, Dan here. And just want to tell everybody again: sign up for our Patreon at patreoncom fuse. and also support the show by getting something from our T Public store, which is linked from our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. In the merch tab, you can find a direct link to our T Public store, and you'll have shirts and masks and other things there. You can get. Uh, to buy and and you know a couple dollars there when you buy those uh, goes to help support the show and also just gets the word out and um, yeah I want to give a uh, a special thank you today to uh, Jacob from Holland and to our friends from Texas and to Digifin Media so thank you to Jacob and our friends from Texas and Digifin Media for making this episode possible. Um, and uh, also I want to credit our editor and mixer, Luke Burson, and our music composer, Kevin Blumenfeld. Anything else, Drew? I just want to say that everybody should like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you are listening to this podcast. Just do it. Just do it. Just tell people about it. It really goes a long way, and it really helps us out, and we really appreciate it. So thank you guys so much, and we'll be back next week. <laughs> Oh,
Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.